In our next session, we have three parent panelists who will share their experience with daily life after transition. Kathy Dodd lives with her husband and their two daughters in a suburb of Chicago. Stacy, now 23, had her first seizure in January 1999 and was diagnosed with Dravet syndrome in 2006. Like so many other patients, Stacy has endured hundreds of seizures, too many trips to the emergency room, lots of failed epilepsy medications, and many other challenges. Her determination and strength through all of this has motiv motivated her parents to search for a cure for epilepsy. Kathy and her husband attended their first Dravet conference in 2006, and since then they've attended many other conferences. However, they'll never forget their experience attending the first conference as they felt such comfort in meeting so many families struggling with the same things they were. But they were also overwhelmed by the stories of every family and the difficulties they endured. Because they've lived this journey for over 15 years, they're excited to share their experiences with others and are always available to provide an ear to listen or a shoulder to cry on. Kathy serves as a DSF family ambassador as well as on the Misericordia Women's Auxiliary Board and is also on the Village Board of Wilmette. Our second panelist is Diane Martin Rudnick. Diane was born in London and grew up in Tampa, Florida. She earned her degree in mass communications at the University of South Florida and has lived on the West Coast since 1987. Her adult children, Sierra, who is 27, and Kai, almost 24, both have the SCN1A variant, paternally inherited, and Kai is on the Dravet end of the spectrum. Diane is passionate about a cure in her children's lifetime. She seeks to honor her mother, Barbara, a research chemist, by supporting families in this journey. And our final panelist is Barbara Sawyer. Barbara is a volunteer, advocate, blogger, and written contributor in the community of families caring for children with special needs and medical complexity. She and her husband are the parents of two adult children, the youngest of whom has a diagnosis of Dravet syndrome and secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. Barbara is active with the Dravet Syndrome Foundation as a member of the Caregivers of Adults with Dravet Syndrome Advisory Board, and she has a particular interest in palliative care and healthcare transition issues, and is active as a parent advisory board member and frequent contributor for the Courageous Parents Network. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for attending this session, which is on daily life after transition programming. Uh, we're very excited to have the opportunity to share our experiences with you uh, regarding um, eat, uh, trans transitioning your child out of kind of educational services into adulthood. Uh, my name is Kathy Dodd. I'm very excited to be joined um, by two other uh, wonderful moms, uh, Diane Martin Rudnick from Seattle. Um, and Barbara Sawyer from Boston. Um, I am from Chicago. Um, I have a daughter, Stacy, who is um, 23. Um, Diane has a son, um, Kai, who is 23, and Barbara has a son, Jake, who's 25. We'll all introduce ourselves in a little bit. Um, we're excited to be here. Um, this is obviously a big topic um, and one that there's lots to cover. Uh, we hope tonight, just today, excuse me, just to give you an overview or roadmap of things to consider when you start to think about uh, what life is going to look like for their for your child once they enter into adulthood. Um, and that will be, the timing of adulthood will vary by state. Um, so it's, we're going to kind of talk about that. It'll be some, you know, for some um, states, it's around 22. For others, it could be a little earlier, a little uh, later, but that's how we're going to, how we want you all to think about it is when you kind of move out of the educational entitlement programs into um, the adult programs within your state. I'm gonna, we're going to each start by just sharing a little bit of information about our, our, each of our individual uh, kids. We think that'll help you all understand kind of the perspectives we're coming from. Each of us, we know every child with Dravet is different. Every child with Dravet is special. Um, we all love our kids dearly, um, but it's helpful to just kind of have a sense of what, where we're coming from as we talk about what, our, what we see our child's adulthood looking like. Uh, so my daughter's name is Stacy. Um, I have uh, three other kids. Um, she's our youngest. Um, she, I just want to start by saying her most favorite holiday is Halloween. So we're walking around talking about Halloween every single day. And she's asking when um, pumpkins are coming. Um, she um, transitioned out of her transition program during the pandemic. So she turned 22 in June of 
2020. Um, so now she attends a day program in our community several days a week. Uh, they, th that's what she's happening now. That day program opened about six months ago um, on a limited schedule, uh, but we are able to get her out of our home a little bit. Um, she has seizures about every two to three weeks, uh, usually at night, um, lasting about one minute. Um, she used to have seizures more frequently, and we recently put her on Fintepla, um, and that has helped, although she does have clusters of seizures now sometimes. So she, while she doesn't have them quite as often, what's happening is now she's having maybe two to three in a, when she has one at night. Um, her current medication regimen is Steranpental, um, Amphi, Depakote, and then, like I said, Fintepla, which is our newest one that's been added. Um, she does receive what we call is adult home-based service funding. So within our state, as she turned um, in, aged age 22, she's receiving funding through the state, um, which helps us pay for her day programming. Uh, she qualifies for SSI and she's, she gets Medicaid as, for her medical coverage. Um, we, our longer term plan for Stacy, um, as we've planned this out is for her to eventually move into a residential program in the Chicago area. Um, the timing of that is very much up in the air. Um, so, but we hope in the next maybe year to two, it's possible that she would live in a residential program. Uh, Stacy is quite delayed. Um, she's uh, developmentally about a three year old ish in terms of her skill set. Uh, she has limited communication. She has some, I have behavioral challenges here. I don't want to, she's, but you know, she's, she does have some behavioral challenges. Um, and, you know, she's, you know, she doesn't really have an IQ because she's just really not able to be tested for an IQ. So she's got a very, very low IQ. Um, but she is a wonderful, happy, very social child. And I, I mentioned that she's very social. She likes to be out and about. That's really important to her. And I mentioned that today just because that that's what's helping us drive the kind of program that we think she's going to be happy in. And so it's a, you'll learn that it's really important to think about your kid. There's no right or wrong answer here. And we'll talk about that more. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Diane, who will introduce herself and share a little bit about her wonderful son, Kai. Hi everyone. Um, so my son Kai had a birthday last Sunday and he turned 24. Um, he and his sister Sierra, who is 27, both inherited the SCN1A from their father. And we actually didn't find that out until Kai was nine and a half and Sierra was 12. Once we found out, we were, you know, better able to target the medications that would be most effective for them. So Kai is a wonderful guy with kind of a lot going on. So he is on the Dravet end of the SCN1A spectrum. And, you know, his behaviors are something else. Um, he can get very manic. And I don't think that's just the Dravet, but, you know, there's some family history on both my side of the family and his side, his father's side. Um, definite ADHD, which we have not been able to find uh, medication to help with. Um, the big fun is the disruptive behavior disorder. He was diagnosed at 12 and I had never heard of such a thing, but you know, he's great except when he throws things and hits and, and, and you know, that type of stuff is, is not fun. So um, he does have quite good seizure control right now. Um, the last seizure he had gone, let's say he had a seizure breakthrough about three weeks ago. And then the past week has just been stressful. And we couldn't figure out what he was trying to tell us with behavior. But yesterday I got him to the urgent care and turns out he has um, a respiratory infection. And so we started him on antibiotic. And yesterday when I was driving to pick up his sister, he fell asleep in the car and seized while I was driving. Thankfully, the VNS stopped the seizure um, after about 10 seconds, and I was able to pull over, um, put the magnet on, and then he did have a few during the night, but the hitting, thankfully, uh, has been passed. So he does go through these cycle things where you're just like, oh, I wish this would end soon. But other than that, you know, he's a really fun guy. This picture is him at the beach. Um, thankfully, we live like four miles from a couple different beaches. Uh, we can go to another one that's seven miles away. And that's really what helps keep us sane is, you know, he loves to go to the beach. He loves to splash rocks. He's happy. He's social. We just have to keep an eye out for if he sees um, 
balloons and stuff at a picnic table. He's going to want to go that direction. So we have to redirect. But yeah, he's he's very outdoorsy. He's very um, he's very social. He's a really fun guy. So his medications are the VNS, which we got the first one when he was four. And, you know, we, of course, we've had several because you have to keep updating it. And his last one was put in um, February 10th, 2020. So it's been about a year and a half. We check it on the uh, when we see neurology, everything is going fine. So he has the VNS, he has it's on Depakote, Omphi, Serapentol, and an older med, potassium bromide, which just adding that back in 2015 seemed to really help. Um, obviously, we'd like to have him on fewer meds. Um, we did manage to get him back down on the potassium bromide, but he started seizing some more. So as we all know, it's a real fine, real fine balance. So I've been a single mom uh, since uh, 2022, 20, uh, 2002 when I separated and then divorced. So I've been doing this, you know, really by myself. Um, and we would get Medicaid um, personal care hours. And things just got to the point in... We, uh, Kai and I were in an accident, which hurt my back in 2013. Then in 2014, the landlord sold our house out from under us, basically. So we moved to an apartment and my daughter had some issues and there was just a lot going on. Um, my back hurt. I broke my back picking up Kai, which wasn't fun. And then I found out that my right knee was just not going to continue. It was bone on bone arthritis. And what spurred us to consider out of home placement was when we went to his, see his psychiatrist and Kai, I think in the effort to hug her, knocked her glasses off and she cut part of her eye and she just said, I'm going to take this decision out of your hands. So that was probably spring of 2015. And so you know, there's always pluses and minuses to an out-of-home placement. And right now he's living with me again because um, there were some issues. So we're still looking for, you know, a, a home placement that I can work with. And so basically he's on the core waiver. We're in Washington State. Um, I qualify for, I think, 432 hours of respite. So um, if there's an opening, he can go into... Um, like for up to two weeks in his plan year, um, you know, he can go uh, spend the night while I go do something or Sierra and I go do something. Um, he does get SSDI through his father's work benefit. Uh, we were doing some vocational um, training, but that kind of stopped at the moment. Um, so we're definitely looking for another supportive living arrangement that, you know, is more accountable to us. Um we have to be careful with him. He likes to hug people and he's very strong and very enthusiastic. And especially, you know, you can tell if someone's got some arthritis and all and, you know, so it's, but he's, he's very affectionate as we see with our, our kids. They, they really come to us with, you know, unconditional love. They just, even if they're hitting and acting up, we know that deep down they love us. It's just a matter of figuring out what we as either a couple or a single parent or dealing with some other, what we can do. And the whole idea is to keep all of us safe and happy. Okay, it's Barbara's turn. Hi, everybody. I'm Barbara Sawyer. I'm Jake's mom. And Jake lives at home with us full time. He is 25 years old. He's about to turn 26. Um, I live at home with my husband, and then Jake has an older brother who lives um, out of the house but close by, who's just turned 29. Jake has been home-based since he was about 10 years old. He is fully dependent on others for care, so I am basically his primary caregiver along with my husband when he's home. Um, he works at Boston and in New York, so he travels quite a bit. I do get some support um, with nurses and PCAs, which are allocated to us by the state. And as we all know, COVID has um, done a number on a lot of families and a lot of help coming in. So right now we're a little bit short on help. Jake is nonverbal and he's G-tube dependent. Like I mentioned, he's been in a home-based program um, since he was 10 years old and he aged out of school entitlement here in Massachusetts at age 22. 
So we worked for four years from age 18 to 22 to create a program under something here called self-direction. So he currently at home receives a few hours of school every day, plus multiple therapies, um, being massage, music therapy, and physical therapy and OT, which we'll get into a little bit more later when we talk about home-based programming. Um, like I mentioned, he's adult state agency funded. Here it's called DDS. So they give us funding for this home-based program. He also receives SSI and he also has private insurance along with state-based Medicaid. He averages about 12 tonic-clonic seizures per month and they're a little bit longer, it sounds like, um, than some of the others. His average three to seven minutes long. And like Kathy is experiencing, we've also developed clusters and that's been pretty recently in the past couple of years. He also tends to have um, twice yearly status events. When he was younger, he had status every three weeks until we started him on a keto diet. Then he didn't have status at all for almost 15 or 20 years, I would say. And it came back several years ago and um, it presents sort of like a complex partial status or in our case, very often an, an autonomic status, which can last 24 hours to 48 hours to longer if we don't get it under control. Um, that being said, we are very slow to go to the hospital and don't take him in often. We manage most of his care here at home. Um, his current meds, um, the major ones that for Dravet, he's been a keto diet kid for most of his life. We started the keto diet at 17 months and we are still going along on it. Um, what's interesting about that, just a brief mention, is he started um, when he was 17 months old and he ate at that point with you know utensils and by mouth. And now he's he's gone from food by mouth to just liquids by G-tube to just not eating entirely. So he's completely G-tube dependent and we're still on the diet. He also is on a very sub-therapeutic dose of Keppra. He was in the fenfluramine trial. So he's been on Fintepla for a few years now and he takes Ativan at night and as a rescue med along with others. Um, our biggest challenges at this age, um, especially due to COVID is pro program and home care staffing and consistency. Um, you know, I am the fallback basically. So when we don't have the right providers or we don't have the school staff, it, it pretty much lands on me as a parent, which is, you know, the way we have it set up. Um, we're very mindful and concerned about developing a sustainable plan as my husband and I age and as Jake grows older. We do deal with increasing comorbidities, um, things like kidney stones. People have mentioned behaviors, which is not a big one for us, but we do have um, some other things happening as he ages, even as minor as something like high cholesterol. And we also deal a lot with autonomic storms. Um, that all being said, he is our pride and joy and a complete treasure to us. He loves his family. We are really lucky that we have a large local extended family. Um, and I believe he has a really good quality of life living at home with us right now. And Kathy, I'll hand it back to you. All right. Thank you, uh, Diane and Barbara, for sharing such wonderful stories about your kids. So um, I wish we had time to hear stories about everybody else's kids who are on mm -hmm. here as then we would really be able to um, focus our time. But um, so we're, I, I first want to start out this out by saying this is an emotional topic. There's it, and it's a hard topic and there's no way around that. And um, I've had my share of tears dealing with this and thinking about it, even on my, in my own, when I've been talking with, um, with her, Stacy's teachers or whatever. Um, and so just know that and it, but it's an important one, obviously, because, um, and for those of you who might have, you know, other older kids, you know, your kids never leave you even when they're adults, you know? So, um, but this is a harder one because th these kids take so much. And I hate to use the word kids because we're talking about adults, but I think all of us still consider all of our kids, our kids, cause they are, and especially these uh, special ones. So um, in terms of the format for today's presentation, we have about probably 30 to 35 minutes of, of material that we're going to go through um, and kind of, and then you could feel free to use the chat to answer questions. Um, Dr. Veronica Hood will be tracking those as we go along, and then we will end the session with Q&A. And so those, um, those questions we'll try to cover kind of um, as a panel, each of us can ask them um, as appropriate. So... Um, 
there's a lot to think about when you think about transitioning to adulthood. We're only going to cover one small part of it. Hopefully you got some of that today um, in terms of the financial and estate planning um, that that was just covered uh, right before us. There are obviously, as we've all talked, the three of us have talked about just eligibility and, and qualifying for your federal and state programs is a huge part of that. Um, guardianship um, and what kind of guardianship to t- uh, cover. Um, and then obviously a, a a really important one is just transitioning from pediatric care to adult care. Um, so, and, and I'm hopefully you heard a little bit about that before that uh, the Dravet syndrome foundation is really making some strides there to help all of us. Um, mm-hmm. So we want to acknowledge that those are all part of preparing your child to transition into adulthood. However, today we're really just going to focus on kind of what the programming is going to look like, what your kid's going to be doing um, during, as, a, as an adult, what their daily life is going to look like, what the, how they're going to spend their time, who's going to help them, where they're going to live, things like that. So um, I, I want to share a couple of quick things too. All of us have been very impacted by COVID. There's, you know, that has a whole range of emotions here. I just encourage all of you to think beyond COVID um, because hopefully someday in the near future, COVID will be behind us. It'll have an impact on us for sure. But don't let COVID totally drive what you think is the right long-term decision. So just, but, but I want to acknowledge, I know that's in the back of our minds, especially with caregivers and things like that. And then the other thing I'd just like to add is um, in, encourage you to, as you're thinking about this, include family members and people who are important in your lives in this decision. Um, because they're, you don't know how long your child's going to be living. Uh, those important people have a very emotional uh, commitment, whether it's your um, other kids or your siblings. Um, they have a lot of care and love for your child as well. And so I just, we would encourage you to think about that. So we're gonna, I'm going to go through these next uh, two slides, which just um, somewhat quickly, just so we get to the meat of the material here. Um, but it's important to think about preparing for adulthood before educational entitlement ends within your state. Um, because that at that time, you do have a lot of resources, whether they're school resources or whatever, that can really guide you through this process. Um, and, you know, I, again, I would equate this a little bit to those of you who have um, kids more typical kids, you know, you start to think about college if your kind of kid's going to go to college or you start to think about, you know, a job training program when your kids are in high school. And so this is no different, uh, really. And so just make sure as you're starting kind of that late teen age, what depending on it, you know, 18, 19 ish or whatever, that you're starting to create a vision and then a transition plan for what adulthood is going to look like. And then think about those IEP goals, those are the goals that you put in when you're in an educational uh, setting. Uh, Think about those goals to help you get ready for what, you know, to really focus on the things that are going to help you with this transition to adulthood. Um, And those could be things like, you know, social interactions and engagement, if that's important to your child, you know, maintaining or maximizing activities of daily living. Um, You know, that can be a variety of things as, you know, as things like opening, you know, the refrigerator, you know, to help them to go into the bathroom, brushing teeth, whatever. Um, obviously, mobility in, in, um, and independence in terms of navigating is a big thing. Many of our kids have lots of gait issues and things like that, making it very important getting up and down stairs if your kid is not in a wheelchair and things like that. So, um, so um, and I'm not going to go through the rest of these, but it is, this is the time to really, as you're in, as you're t- thinking about transitioning into adulthood, this is the time to really be thinking about those goals that are going to help your child be successful in an adult environment. Um, and then um, remember that this is about your kid um, and what your kid's needs are. And you are the biggest advocate for your child. And so as you're working with these, with the school or the state agencies who can also help you, just re- remember and focus on that. So, um, and then these are just sample, these are sample IEP goals that each of us have kind of thought about. So I'm just gonna let all of you kind of look at them. Um, an important point to kind of just uh, 
say here is, you know, once you're out of the I, IAP setting for lack of, you're going to have more of these ISP goals, which are more, those are basically adulthood type goals. So be sure to think about that. Be sure to think about those things that are important to you now that you want to make sure transition into adulthood. So that could be, you know, music therapy for your child. It could be dog therapy, you know, things that these are going to help set the, these are going to help set the framework for what you want to continue into adulthood. And so just kind of don't forget to be thinking about those. Um, I don't, Diana Barra, we only have a, a minute or so on this. Do you, do either of you guys, I went through this slide obviously very quickly, just in the interest of time. Do you guys, either of you want to add anything quickly to this? Let's go ahead, Barbara. I'd be happy to add something. I, I think you just made a really good point, Kathy, that um, has been very important for us, but also across the board. When Jake turned 18 and we were, we started preparing for a transition at 22, one of the things that I did with his IEP was I tried to be very strategic with how I wrote his goals so that anything that he might age out of between school entitlement and in his case, he was in pediatric palliative care that ended at 19. So just one example that we put under there under speech OT, um, he had music therapy through palliative care for seven years and I knew it was going to end. So what I did strategically was I put in music fund therapy in his IEP under a speech goal so that then the school had to provide music therapy until he was 22. And then once he turned 22, I transitioned that IEP goal into what we call then an ISP goal. So if you start thinking early enough about what do you want for an activity for your child as they age and knowing that they're going to age out ultimately of either an outside service like palliative care or an educational entitlement, think of how you might be able to include that in some way that it makes sense, in our case, under speech therapy, so that that service can continue once they age out of entitlement. Okay, great. Thank you, Barbara. And then my suggestion, um, and you know, keep in mind, this is very emotional. And, you know, especially if you have a kid with behavior issues, which Kai has always had, even before the seizures, focus on a workable positive behavior support plan because you, you want to reward the good behavior and what can happen with, you know, caregivers or, you know, going to an agency is a lot of times people will be from a different continent than we live on. Um, and they maybe have some very traditional ideas like, well, you know, I already told him three times to stop and he's not stopping. Well, they need to wait and they need to, like um, Eileen Devine was saying, you know, keep in mind our kids are 10 second uh, people in a one second world. So the big thing is get a very concrete positive behavior support plan that the school is going to follow, the home people are going to follow. If you have, you know, if you're transitioning and like Kai is back with us, so the caregivers will follow and, you know, make sure they're sticking to it because if they, don't follow it and you know, start yelling at your child or something that all the behavior is going to go south and you're in a big mess. So you just make sure that this happens and that your values and your concern for your child and this, all of our parents, all of our, all of our children take incredible, incredible patience, sometimes more than we feel we have, but we just have to pull it out and keep doing it. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. So now we're going to kind of, um, start to think about, okay, so as you think about adulthood and creating a vision, what should you be thinking about? Um, and these are, we're going to touch on each of these in, in more detail. So um, you think about, are they going to live at home or are they going to live in a residential program? You no, know, that's one, where are they going to sleep basically? Then it's like, okay, what are they going to do during the day? Um, and that's whether you're going to do some sort of home-based um, day programming or community-based day programming. Then for some, you know, this could be a small uh, group. Some, there might be opportunities vocational um, to keep them busy. Um, and then the other kind of things are just how, how are they going to get there? That's transportation. What kind of transportation do they need? You know, your availability as the parents in terms of driving them or not. Um, recreation, leisure activities, depending on, uh, you know, what people enjoy to do. Like Diane's mentioned, her son loves to go to the beach. Whatever your kid is likes to do. Um, and then obviously, who's going to do it, which is all about caregiving. Um, and the, so as you're thinking about a vision for your child, think about 
ask yourself what makes them happy. That's mm-hmm. the first and most important question. What makes them thrive? And so um, that's really where you should start. And then the other thing I just want to say is, and I think that's why the three of us bring a really great perspective. There's no right or wrong answer here. Um, and, and as emotional as, and it's, it's okay if you change your mind, <laughs> you know? Um, so just because I might be going down one path doesn't mean it's the right path for, um, you know, um, you or whatever. And we want to, we're going to try to talk about the positives and, you know, there's positives and negatives for any path you choose, as we know, that's what life's all about. But uh, just don't feel bad if you're making a different decision than what we might be making or what your friend thinks you might be making. Um, do, you know, it's what ha- makes your child thrive is important. What makes you thrive is important. You have to be healthy to care for your child. And you've been caring for your child for a really long time. So that's okay. So thinking about how much longer you think you could do or, you know, um, is also important. So anyways, just kind of want to give that framework. So we're going to start out by first talking about living arrangements, then we'll move into day programming, and then we'll touch on some of the other ones. Um, So I'm just going to talk a little bit about residential living option considerations. I think I started out earlier saying that we do plan to move our daughter, Stacy into a residential living option um, at some point. I want to acknowledge that the day we do that, I'll be crying like a baby. (laughs) So I don't want to make it seem like this has been an easy decision by any means. Um, so, um, but anyway, so think about kind of the timing. So it, I don't mean like the day they finish educational entitlement, they're going to, you know, the, the, your kids are going to be moving out. So think about when you might be ready and it could be 10 years down the road or whatever, but then you've got to first research and understand options in your area. I mean, there might not be options that you're comfortable with and that crosses this off or I know some families have taught that I'm aware of have even moved to a different state to get where they want. So, Um, And then you've got to think about if you want your child to live out of your home at some point, what does that look like? Do you want a group home that's managed by an agency? You could do a group home with a number of families where you're um, potentially managing that. Um, A community integrative living arrangement is a home or some sort of setup where you are living in a community that can be independent or uh, managed by an agency. Um, you know, depending on the complexity of your child's medical needs, you need to think about whether you need some sort of skilled nursing. Um, so there's a variety of housing alternatives within the residential living option. Um, and then other things uh, that you need, should be thinking about is just what does your child need in terms of support? Um, and what, what are you going to be comfortable with? So staff to resident ratios, 24 hour supervision. Many of our kids obviously need that for those of us who have seizures. Um, and some of the state agencies are re- going to require that anyways. Um, and other medical issues. Um, so that's a huge, you know, some places aren't comfortable with kids with seizures, um, sadly, you know. So um, those are things for you to be thinking about. The shared living space versus private space, I've heard this in talking with when I, we did some evaluation of these residential options. So for many of us, our kid has been the last one at the home. <laughs> and so they pretty much are ruling the roost for lack of a better word. (laughs) And so they're used to more private space. They probably have their own, potentially their own room. Um, And so you just need to be think their own bedroom, excuse me, maybe not, but, and so you just need to be thinking about if you're moving, if you're looking at a residential program that look, you know, has shared bedrooms and things like that, is your child going to be comfortable in that kind of setting? Um, And then obviously funding. (laughs) That's, I mean, that, we, that could be at the top, but we don't want it to be at the top because that kind of goes to timing of move. Um, because obviously how you're going to pay for this is a huge um, thing to consider. Other things, these are just kind of, these are in addition, I would say this slide, these are the most important things, but there are lots of other things um, to consider, which is what do they do during the day? If you're happy with that, what, how often can you come visit? What, you know, what are the accommodations for accessibility just to make sure that your child's going to be safe in that environment? What are they doing in terms of managing and training staff? Um, And that's an important one. You know, one of the things to think about if you're going to move your child into a residential living is, are you ready to give up control? 
Are you ready to have somebody else make these decisions for you? You have been making every decision for your child since the day they were born. And if you decide to move your child to a residential living, depending on what you're doing, depending on if it's run by an agency, they're going to be staff. They're going to be hiring the staff. They're going to make some decisions. And that's don't underest, underestimate that. Don't underestimate how hard that could be for you. Um, mm -hmm. And my husband and I have spent a lot of time talking about this. <laughs> um, and I, I always say, well, my husband's happy to do that because he hasn't been taking so much of the care. But, you know, so anyways, just be thinking about that. Um, and then the last thing here is just you do want to think about continuum of care, no different than if you were moving like one of your parents or whatever, which is as your child ages and potentially needs additional services needs, does this residential living provide that? You know, so if you're going to put them in a home with four other families and then in 10 years they can't do stairs, are you going to have to move them out again or whatever? So mm -hmm. um, those are just things. Um, so again, this, we're giving you kind of a menu of things to think about, and each of you are going to have to decide which of these are most important for you to help make your decision. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I said, you know, one thing I just want to say about, um, our daughter Stacy and why we've made the decision to move her into residential living is she is very social and likes to be on the go. And mm -hmm. we've seen that more than ever during the pandemic when she was home and we can't keep her uh, engaged as much as she wants. Um, we know that. I see how unhappy she is not being in a school setting. And so we, but even though I'm not sure that this is entirely what we want for her, we know she's going to be happier in an environment where she's around a bunch of other adults her age um, and, and thriving. And it's also because we can't continue to do that as, as we get older. And so we're really making that decision because we think that's what she wants, even though it might not be entirely what we want. Um, and so I just kind of end this kind of discussion about our decision to residential for you all to be thinking about that. So I'm going to actually turn this over to Barbara, who's going to provide another very valuable perspective about the benefits of having your child in a home-based living environment. Thank you, Kathy. And after listening to you, I feel like my head is spinning with so much I want to add to this slide. Um, the first point being, it is so hard to give up that control. And I think we all feel it and we all get there at different times, but also for the long term and for sustainability, we all have to learn to be able to give up some control, even if you opt to have your child living at home. Um, and your child, keep in mind, as they age, they're still going to be coming home. So even if you decide you go the residential route or if you do a day program, your, your child, your adult child is either going to be home full-time, part-time or visiting at home. And obviously as these kids get older, they get much more, they get larger, they get more physically mature. Um, and in some cases, and it's been the case for us, they can begin to decline as they age and their abilities to do certain things. So we have gone the other direction and opted to keep Jake at home. Part of it, um, we have explored some residential opportunities. We did that when he was still a student. Um, part of the issue for us is he's pretty medically fragile and complex, and he's not robust enough to qualify for a group home or going to a day program. If we were to put him in a residential placement, it would have to be along the lines of a medical home or a nursing home. And we've decided that for our family, that's just not what we want. And that being said, he is very social, but he's very social in a home environment. He loves his family. He loves his relatives. He likes familiarity. And we just feel like it's the best place for him. So all that being said, there's a lot that goes into also keeping your child at home because as they're growing and aging, like I said, you're, you're going to need to have some modifications in your home for accessibility. Um, you know, are you going to need to build a ramp? Are they going to become dependent on a wheelchair? So do you need to widen your doorways? How are you going to get them in and out of your house if you have steps into, like we have steps into our garage? So when Jake was 16, he stopped being able to walk independently without help. And until then, you know, we have a four bedroom colonial. He was going up and down the stairs and we opted to put an addition on our house um, to support his needs so we could keep him at home. Um, and along with that, so we, we built a ramp, we have a way to get him in and out of the house, we have a stroller, we're getting a wheelchair, 
Um, we widened doorways, he sleeps in a hospital bed. We needed to have a second bed in the room because somebody sleeps in the room with him. Um, and then you think beyond that to durable medical needs. How are you going to do hygiene? You know, are you going to put them in a bathtub? Does your child need a bath chair? Can you build a roll in shower and then you need a rolling shower chair? Um, if they're not able to stop, if they're not able to walk independently or even to walk with assistance and turn into a, a car, how are you going to transport them? Do you have a wheelchair or a stroller that you can buckle down in an adaptive mode of transportation? Um, supportive furniture for us that has been a hospital bed. It's been a rift and share. Um, we can only buy leather couches because he's incontinent. So we have pads and leather couches all over the family room, which is not my choice, but it's what supports his needs. Um, we also have a changing table that we actually built into his bathroom. It's a massage table. So we use that table for physical therapy, massage therapy, and to change him when he gets in and out of the shower. So all of those things that you need to think about, how are you going to accommodate their needs if they live at home for the long term? And the, one of the bigger ones is caregiving. Are you going to be the primary caregiver? In some states, um, you can be paid to be the primary caregiver. Then that factors into guardianship decisions. So you need to be aware that it's not that simple. You need to qualify and factor in outside things. Um, or are you going to bring in outside help? In our case, we have um, right now about 55 hours of nursing and 55 hours of personal care assistance. But that also comes with you know, yearly assessments and are we eligible and how much do they make? And then of course COVID that we mentioned, but even beyond COVID, it's, it's a big job to sort of hire and train and keep that help around to help you. And if it doesn't, you know, if you don't have that help, it falls on the parent. So all of the things written under that caregiving, the attrition, you know, you might have nurse, a full-time nurse for a year and then that nurse leaves. So there's always sort of this push and pull of having enough help doing it yourself and making sure you've lined up the supports that you can keep going with this. And then that leads into, of course, something we've already mentioned, long-term sustainability. I'm, I live you know, with Jake at home, but I always live with the worry, what if something happens to me? Because I feel like I'm the ship and if the ship goes down, I, I don't feel like I have a very solid concrete plan. And even though I'm really happy with the setup as we have it at home, I'm always very mindful and it's always in the back of my mind, what happens if we can't do this anymore? You know, And that ties into the health and aging of the parent. I have to be healthy enough and well enough to take care of him. Um, the other piece of this that is, it's sort of a double-edged sword, your home is not your home. So if Jake lives here full time, we have in a good year between his programming, which we'll talk about in a minute, and his, his caregivers, I've had up to 20 to 22 people working at our house at any given time. And they come in, in and out all the time. Like we have a policy here, just walk in, don't knock. It's harder for me if you knock because then I have to get rid of Jake and get up to the door. So your home is never quite your home. And my husband and I often joke that we need to have a caregiver come so we can go out so we can have some time alone. Very much it's the three of us a lot of the time. Um, and then that turns into as you age, it becomes a little bit isolating. Um, you know, we're almost 60 years old. Most of our friends are empty nesters. Our kids are in their 20s and 30s. They're downsizing, they're taking vacations, they're moving out, and we're sort of like sitting home with Jake watching Elmo. Um, so you kind of never get that empty nest unless you can carve a path for your child to move out of the home and be supported in a good environment for them. So those are just some of the things to think about if you choose the path of keeping your child at home, either for the short term or the long term. Barbara, can I just, Diane, do you want to just, you know, we've talked about just, um, you know, our considerations for residential and Barbara's considerations for home base. Do you want to share kind of briefly, quickly, just kind of where, what you're thinking of? It might be helpful for everybody to hear that from you. Sorry about that, Barbara. But I think, you know, I think part of this is, um, like I was just thinking as, as we were talking, I was like 12 when I realized that I need to start saving money for college. And so I started putting aside my 50 cents. I had to ask for a raise to 75 cents an hour for babysitting and all. And I think even though it, this is a very emotional decision, it's very difficult. We need to start talking to people when our kids are about 12. I mean, before puberty hits, because, you know, 
things for the most part may not get easier. There may be some kids that things get easier, but for the most part, I mean, and Kai is bigger than me and he's stronger than me. And he's even, I'm persistent. He's more persistent and he can throw things. And when he throws things, things can, so it's like, you know, maybe some extra counseling or all, but we can't be in a denial about this. I mean, we like, for instance, things didn't go well in his last play, placement. So he's back with me and I'm paid for 40 hours a week uh, as an independent contractor with the state to care for him. But they ask you, what are your plans for your child if something happens to you? And, you know, really as parents, all of us think about this, but for our kids, like I'm it, you know, his father and I are not in communication. I have five siblings, but we all literally and figuratively live in different states. They're not going to be helpful. So we have to start thinking. We have to, what really helped me was he qualified when he was 12 and a half after the diagnosis of disruptive behavior disorder. And I was all covered with bite marks and scratches and all from him. And so we qualified for the children's in-home intensive behavior support plan. And ABA therapists came in or ABA therapists came in and, you know, helping with that. And they communicated with the schools and the schools. I have got to say, we paid you know, more money and rent to live in um, a very, very good school district. And it's been worth every penny. I am still in touch with people that knew him in developmental preschool, developmental kindergarten. Right now, I'm able to participate in this conference because a very close friend of ours who I worked with as a paraeducator, and um, she has worked with Kai before. And so she is taking care of Kai right now. He's not feeling well, but she's got it. She knows the seizures. She's, And so I'm able to do this. Don't be afraid to ask for help. It's not, and you know, if there's behavior issues and your kid hurts somebody or hurts you, you're reaching out and asking for help. So it puts you in a category of how can we support this person? She really, so when you're asking for help, it's really, it's not only self-love, but it's love for your child. It's like, it takes a village. How do I, so yeah. And, you know, trying to, it is disruptive having caregivers come in. It really is. They may not have the same hygiene that you have. I mean, especially if you're, if you have a son and guys are coming in, it's like, they may not be wearing the deodorant that your son there's just a whole lot of different things but just try your hardest to be open-minded and to explore many many different options you can always say no but you've got to get on lists and things and you've got to talk with other parents and what may sound like a good idea but like for instance Kai is funded for two-on-one 24-7 in case he has a seizure and falls down and clunks his head it's going to take more than one person And so that's what we have to look for is, you know, can people can say, and right now everyone's saying no because of the pandemic, but like Kathy wisely brought up, the pandemic will eventually be over. It'll be behind us and life will go on right now. We're all kind of in maybe a holding pattern, but yeah, start being open-minded when they're like 12 or so keep thinking about it. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to cover kind of day programming. Barbara's going to talk about her, you know, the program she's put in place for home-based, and then we'll talk about community-based. Right. So we, um, like I said, we have Jake in a home-based program. He started in a home-based program when he was 10 um, on the advice of his doctors. He had just finished second grade and he had been sick for the entire year of school. And he also has a mitochondrial disease component. So that affects sometimes his ability to get over illness. And they basically said to me, you should either keep him home from school or expect that he's just always going to be sick. So at the time, I set up a program in cooperation with the school that we would school him at home. So he got all of his school PTOT speech at home. When he turned 18 and we started working with um, adult based agencies, I said to them, he's, you know, he's the square peg in the round hole. He's not going to be able to go to a day hub program. He's not vocationally, you know, in need. Um, He doesn't have the stability seizure wise to get on a bus at eight in the morning and go to a day program until three. He would probably miss at least 50% of it. Most of his seizures are nocturnal. So um, we, we, 
formed this plan over four years working with this agency where we would continue to bring the program to him. And I wanted it to look very similar to what we already had in place on his IEP and what we were doing already. And that was actually an advantage for me because I was used to doing it. So we do this program called um, self-direction. It's funded by the state. Um, we needed to write a proposal and we needed to present it to DDS, the agency who funds it, and they had to approve it. So a lot of this comes with a lot of back work and also a lot of negotiating. And it's also, you have to remember, um, not an entitlement. So funding varies year to year. It's not necessarily given to you. So any type of home programming or any, in my experience, any type of funding that you receive is not guaranteed once they age out of the system. So it's just something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. But what we've been able to do is create this program for Jake in our situation to meet him exactly where he's at on any given day. So if it's a tough day, we might not do school, but we might have massage and music come in. Um, he's done pet therapy. We've bought him an adaptive bike. So depending on how he's feeling, we can modify the program each day to meet him wherever his needs are at that day. He can also lay in bed and sleep all day if he needs to, but he doesn't have the pressure, nor do I as a parent of getting him up and showered and dressed and out of the house by the time the van's going to come to take him somewhere. So it's given us maximum flexibility to accommodate for his medical fluctuations. And again, it's allowed us to do, you know, to think outside the box rather than whatever an agency decides to do during a day program, we can figure out what makes Jake happy. And I remember um, when I was first talking to the agency, I kept talking about massage therapy and they were like, well, we don't really do massage therapy for people. And I said, well, you know what? He's been getting it in palliative care for seven years. He was in hospice for two years. He loves it. So, you know, as long as I could justify the need, now he gets massage therapy six hours a month. He gets music therapy four hours a week. He gets physical therapy four hours a week. So the things that work for Jake is what I focus on using the funding for. And, mm -hmm. you know, Diane especially touched on this, or Kathy did too, actually, the social aspect of community. A lot of people might think, wow, Jake might feel really isolated at home. Where are his friends? Does he care? And Jake is really interesting. He, um, like I said, we normally have about 20 people working at the house. Right now we have 15. Most of them are students. They're either therapy students or nursing students or special ed students. Um, they're all in their 20s and 30s. They're young women and he adores them. So he lights up when they walk in. He doesn't have the same connection with his peers. So that brings me some solace in realizing that he doesn't, the, the peer thing is actually not important to him. And there were many years I thought about, should he be playing, you know, adaptive baseball every Saturday morning down at the field in town? And he just doesn't get anything out of it. So because he's his unique self, this program actually works for him. Mm -hmm. That all being said, it's a lot of work for me. And um, so you have to be really mindful of that too. Do you want to take this on? And just they're listed there, but under considerations, funding, it's not guaranteed. I'm always going to bat for more funding. Staffing largely falls on me. Um, the agency just told me yesterday that I could use some of my funding to hire somebody to run the program, to help with the payroll, to help hire. But I actually prefer to do that myself which leads into the bandwidth of the parent. Do I have time to do this? If I'm a full-time working single mom, I might not have the time to do this, but I'm lucky enough not to be. And then along those lines, the space, you know, we have, like I mentioned, we had to put an addition on for Jake. We have a whole classroom. There's a stander in there. There's therapy balls. There's a rift and share. He mm -hmm. takes up half our house. Um, so, you know, medical supplies alone take up a lot of room. Um, and then the isolation and socialization is really more about us and Jake, you know, because his program is always here, we're home a lot. Um, we do get out all the time, but sometimes it can be a little confining to always have something based in the home. And again, I'm the backup. If somebody cancels, if the nurse can't come, if the teacher can't come, if whatever is planned, the music therapist can't come, I'm sort of the default person. And that's okay because then he and I just hop in the car and we go out. 
Um, and I've also lately gotten created just one more mention on the bottom is I've tried to shift my strategy to combine program staffing with my care providers. So it's actually been a really nice way for me to take a PCA or a nurse and say, do you want to play a dual role? Do you also want to be a skills trainer? I can pay you more. And that helps us attract more care and staff mm -hmm. because the other thing, as Diane mentioned, it gets really hard as these kids get older and bigger sometimes and sometimes sicker to find caregivers. It's easier when they're cute and little and five and 10 years old. But when you put out an ad saying, I have a, I always try to say, I have a young adult because when I say I have a 25 or six year old, you know, the image in their mind is like the big bearded man that's six feet tall. And it's hard to find people, especially nursing students or any kind of special ed students to come and want to care for that profile patient. So it becomes a little more challenging. Okay, great, thank you. So just a contrast. So Barbara just talked a little bit about what a home-based day program would look like in your home, you know, the, the kinds of things she's got, the number of people that are doing it. Obviously she's a wonder woman, she's managing 20 people. <laughs> um, so, um, and so now we're gonna talk about, you know, evaluating, thinking about a day program. So, you know, the very at a very high level, if you do a program in your home, that's designed for your child um, and you're able to put, put all those things in place. If you decide to do a day program in, in the community outside, it's going to be designed for a broad range of needs. And so just that's kind of the balance that you've got to be thinking about. Um, and so, um, like I said, we send our daughter, Stacy right now to a day program out of our home. You know, you can, you basically, what you're thinking about in any of this is creating a schedule for each day of the week and kind of each hour of the day, you know, that's whether you're doing it in home or out of home, as you're starting to think about moving out of an educational entitlement where they've been in school or whatever, from eight to four, you basically got, and some people, some of your um, children doing an after school activity, you've basically got to fill their day from eight to eight, roughly. And what's that going to look like on Monday through Friday? And, you know, and you've got to kind of think about that. You know, one of the things to, to consider is your own personal work schedule um, and your own financial situation of what you can and cannot afford to do. So think about, so I always, like when I put it together for Stacy and with my work schedule, I'm like, okay, you know, I had four, four, five days a week and what days I needed her to be somewhere or whatever. So, um, and so that's why you, you might do a full day program. You might do a mix of home and um, day programming, um, you know. Um, so again, similar to what we talked about with, um, you know, residential programs, you first got to start to research day programs in your area and their structure. And, you know, and that's first going to tell you whether you, what you can and cannot do and what your options are. And, you know, in, in looking at their structure, you've got to be thinking about, um, you've got to be thinking about the staff ratios they have. Again, you've got to be thinking about whether you need, if your child, if your child needs, your child needs one, child needs one on one really don't allow for that. Um, so then other things um, you, you need to be thinking about is, you know, if you're doing a mix of schedule, who's managing that schedule, you know, and I think Barbara talked about that she, you can possibly hire somebody just, you know, the more you have your child in one place, the less work it is for you. <laughs> but that might not work, I'm just saying, but then you manage if you've got them going to three different day programs, or, you know, three, you know, then you're managing all that likely. And you just got to be thinking about that with your own personal situation. Mm -hmm. um, and then depending on the needs of your child, as you look at day programs, these are other things to be thinking about, which is if they might be doing vocational training, then you want to be thinking about, are this is, is this day program kind of helping create some of those skills? Um, are they going out? If you're, are they doing recreational social components? Are they, go, are they going out of the little building that they're in? And if, if they are, you know, are you comfortable with that? If they're not, that you know, um, and similar to are they, what kind of community outings are they going to? Some community outings are, might be things you're not totally comfortable with your child doing. Um, you know, some of the community outings are actually work-based, um, you know, more vocational-based, and your child may not have the skill set to do that. I've looked at some day programs for Stacy, where, you know, they basically spend their day going to different jobs, as, and, you know, she just can't do that. Um, and, 
Uh, the other thing to be thinking about here is just as you look at your kid's schedule is what is their attention span? You know, can they, do they want, you know, do they need to nap? Just, you know, what can they physically do in a day? You know, some kids only can really be out for two hours or whatever, and then they need to spend the rest of their day kind of at home hanging out a little bit more. And so think about all those things um, when you're evaluating a day program. Um, obviously funding we've talked about. Um, and then this last bullet is really important, which is if you're thinking about having your child go from like an educational, you know, entitlement setting, so a school, whatever that school looks like, to another program, you should begin that transition. You should have the school help you do that because then they can actually bring staff. They're actually required to bring staff, to be honest, um, to help with that transition. Um, and one of the things I've learned, especially because Stacy aged out of the um, of school during the during the pandemic, so she was never really able to transition to these programs. There is some value to having the school do it because you, it's very hard to be a parent and a teacher. Yes. Um, OK, um, and many of us during the pandemic have become that. And it's just it's hard. And you're tra teaching people about your kid. And sometimes there's just some value to not being both. Um, and so, like I said, hopefully the pandemic can be behind us. So I really would encourage you if you're thinking about some sort of day program in your community to have the school help you with that transition. And actually, it should be their expectation. Um, so kind of just this is kind of the wrap up of kind of all the things to think about between living living at home or residential options and um day program options you know and i think for all of you to be thinking about as we move to some other topic is just there's obviously a broad range um and really the range is a little bit about control and how much control you want and need to have given your child's situation and how much you can manage personally based on yourself and your own situation and that'll help you maybe decide what you want to do um and then then the other thing is just the sustainability of these plans so as uh, barbara mentioned she's got an incredible program at home done a lot of great things but you just have to think about your own individual health issues and the you know it can it's very hard to move your child out of the home it becomes harder and harder as they age as well so just and I, again i just think about all those and there's no right or wrong answer it's just mm -hmm. i've um in my discussions it can be hard to do that in an emergency situation which obviously diane shared um that she's you know god forbid that you fall and you need back surgery and then you have to you know, that's not wonderful for your child. Um, and so, again, um, no right or wrong answer, just lots to think about. Um, and we I hope that this is really giving you all some really good things to think about. And it's not a decision you're going to make overnight. That's why we're encouraging you to start it very young, as Diane mentioned, because there's just so many factors and you're going to sleep on it for a very long time. So, all right. These next few things um, kind of go through somewhat quickly just in the interest of time because we want to make sure we have some time for questions. Um, think about, depending on, this is other things to think about in terms of day programming, really. Um, whether there's some vocational options. Many of us spend lots of time with our kids out in these communities doing things, whether they're going maybe to a health club, maybe they're going to a restaurant, a favorite restaurant, you know, and so there is potentially options for you to find a vocational option within your community. Maybe they qualify for a job coach. Again, a lot of this depends on um, where your kid is at, uh, developmentally and things like that. There's a, you know, you could, there's volunteer opportunities. Maybe they can work with you at, you know, a food pantry or something, you know, again, um, these are just quick things to think about if you feel like it's possible that your child could do something. So like Stacy and I during the pandemic started to deliver, um, uh, there was a local coffee shop that ground their own coffee. And so they were delivering coffee beans to people. And so she and I did that together. She can't drive on her own. Obviously she can't, but that's how we 
spent one day a week for an hour. We just picked up this local coffee and delivered it to people's homes. And she liked getting out of the car, ringing the doorbell, giving them a pound of coffee or whatever. And so it can be anything, you know, again, and this was a coffee shop we went to every day together because she loves coffee. Um, and so they were doing it anyway. She's not getting paid. Uh, so, so don't always think that vocational needs to be paid, I guess. So apologize that that was too quick, but transportation, we could spend a lot of time on this slide. Um, and we're, we, um, because I think it's all of us worry about safety of our kids. Um, so depending on what you're thinking about for your child, um, whether you're keeping them at home or not at home, you know, you might, if you're keeping, if you're doing all the transporting, then you need to make sure you have an accessible vehicle. And, the, and what does that look like? And making sure, it, uh, you know, they can, and if you're having, if you're using public transportation or a public van, making sure they have what they need in terms of um, strapping your child in and all those kinds of things. So, and then obviously state provided transportation services are available. Some are not very reliable. Um, obviously, and today we're reading lots and lots about transportation and the reliability. I know a lot of us wish there was better transportation for um, people with disabilities. So anyways, this is just something to be thinking about in your plan for what the day for your child's going to look like. Because once you figure out how, what it might look like, if they're going somewhere, then you got to figure out how you're going to get them there. Um, leisure and recreation is different for everybody and for every one of our kids. Um, these are just suggestions. Probably all of you are thinking about these things already. Just remember to build these in, in as they move into an adult, because, um, recreational and health is so important for our kids. So whether that's getting them walking, whether there's some sort of continued, um, physical therapy, you know, and then I think we also just talked about getting, using this as an opportunity for them to get out so that you can get out. Um, and so look at it, you know, so social outings, um, overnight camps, uh, things like that are all, all in this like leisure umbrella. Some of you may be doing special Olympics or best buddies. Some may not be Stacy. Actually, I think, um, I thought Barbara put it very well, which is, you know, if you have home-based services and you've got a lot of people coming in, your child is getting a lot of social interaction. And that, and that's great. And so don't, you know, social interaction is broad. And then you have to think about, does your kid, you know, many of us say, well, our kids kind of like adults better than peers, especially when they were younger. And so yeah. that's, you know, but if your kid does thrive, which my daughter, Stacy thrives on peer engagement, then finding ways to build that in. I do want to say that it's a lot of work. I've spent a lot of time asking kids if they'll hang out with Stacy for an hour. I'm just like, I can't even manage my own social calendar, which doesn't have a lot going on because I'm managing her schedule all day. Um, and so just, <laughs> I wish I could spend as much time on her, <laughs> on my social calendar as her social calendar, but anyways. All right. Um, so now daily um, caregiver support. So this is just, this is, Caregivers make or break the whole situation. I mean, I think we got to be honest here. I mean, and all of us know that. Um, I mean, you get a great caregiver and it changes your life. Um, you have a poor caregiver and it's just so difficult, right? So, um, and all of us have been able to find obviously great caregivers. So I don't know that we need to spend quite so much time on this, but just Th things to make sure you're thinking about. Cause a lot of times when they're in an educational setting, you can use caregivers that are in the schools or you can use caregivers that are in like uh, the special rec programs. And so those people are being trained by the schools or not. You need to be thinking about when they're an adult, who's doing the training. And often that's you, right? So, because, so you don't have the same access to finding people often. That's what really gets hard, I think, as you move into an adult, that you're, you don't, you can't just ask the school or you can't just, you know, they're just in a different setting. And a lot of times it's a little bit harder, you know, in a, um, a like a day program because those day programs are, the hours are a little bit longer. So just, these are things to be thinking about in terms of who's going to train them, who's going to manage them. Then you become the one managing them, which is also awkward, um, you know, and then how are they getting to your house? <laughs> You know, and if you need somebody to drive and they can't drive, that's, you know, I found great caregivers that then I realize are going to take a bus or whatever, you know, um, and then just 
how comfortable they are with seizures, with your medical issues, with behavioral challenges, um, flexibility and availability, you know, hey, your kid might have had a seizure at night and then they're not going to do a whole lot. And maybe you don't want to pay for somebody. It's just think about those things. Um, and then we just kind of listed in terms of hiring. We just wanted to think you guys to think about try to broaden your network um, to places that you could. So local colleges that potentially have a special education program there or a nursing program there. Um, or even a speech program there where those people, you know, think about that if there's local colleges nearby, um, you know, care.com. We're not promoting any of these particular um, places, you know, we're just using these, but care.com, they have a special needs uh, section you can look at those so that, you know, Craigslist, um, if you guys have next door, a lot of times you have people in the neighborhood that are, you know, looking to do something, you could go back to your school resources. So, um, and then, you know, I don't know, we've, we haven't talked about this as much and, and it's a good thing to just don't forget to use your care manager. And we probably should have brought that up earlier. So, um, so that's the state provided manager that's helping you navigate adult, the adult, the transition to adult and the adulthood life. So they don't forget to use them as a resource through this entire process, because that's just really, really important. Okay. So, wow. Um, I think in the interest of time, I think I'm just going to like, let everybody, you know, we're going to, I think we've talked a lot about um, residential and day programs. These are just things to think about when you're evaluating them. So once you've maybe picked two or three that have matched your criteria, for lack of a better word, so the, the you know the slides were before we're really talking about different options and what you kind of want to be thinking about. So once you've maybe, if you have the pleasure of having more than one, um, then these are the things to be thinking about um, and what you might do in evaluating them. And two that I want to mention under residential program would just be talk to current families that are in those residential programs to hear what, how they like it and what they don't like that. And then secondly, you can research agencies. They have re agency evaluations. Um, if, you know, um, at some point, Diane will probably share some of her experiences here in terms of residential programs, but, you know, make sure you know how other families are feeling. And then you, you can look at feedback of what people are saying about them. Um, and then evaluating day programs. I think a lot of these things we've talked about, um, but just, you know, these are just, again, thinking about the, what the goals are of the program. Oh, the mix of population and range of needs and age is an important one. Okay. That's, yeah, I'm like, um, because, you know, you want to think about that, you know, is, is your child going to be the lowest functioning? Are you okay with that? Are, you know, um, what are the ages there? If they're only 25 and this program mostly has 50 to 55 year olds, again, we're, no right or wrong answer, just things to think about. Um, you know, some of these programs have been around a really long time. So the facilities are not that up to date, especially if you're in a relatively good school district, like it appears some of us are, where they really have more state of the art kinds of programming. And then you move, and I've, ex I have experienced this looking at day programs and then you go and it's like, oh my God, I feel like I've taken a step back in time. Um, and you know, they don't even have Wi-Fi in the buildings or they don't like, you know, they don't even understand kids using iPads or whatever. And I'm like, Ugh. so just, these are things to be thinking about. Um, and comfort, it's it, comfort with seizures and protocol there, especially for day programs. You would expect residential programs to be different. You got to know that you don't want them calling nine one one if you're not a if you're not a fan of that. You know whatever. So these are just again once you've kind of these are all important. You know it's really hard to decide what what you're going to use to evaluate a program. So we want you to be broad in your thinking as you're looking at and making some options, and then as you get down to picking and choosing, these are then a, a additional details. Okay. Wow. That was a mouthful, and we have about 15 minutes left, and I want to make sure we have some time for Q&A. So mm -hmm. I think we, just on behalf of Barbara, Diane, and all, I, we've stressed this, but this, don't underestimate how hard this is for you. Um, and, you know, um, these are just some of the, 
things that we have each felt individually different places. So, you know, it's really hard that you're starting over, you, you know, when you're leaving and it's kind of the safety net of an educational team, and then you're starting with a new team and a new place and a new support system. I think all of us feel isolation at various points in time. I know I do when my friends are texting me saying, Hey, do you want to go out tonight? And I'm like, I can't go out tonight. I have to, you know, um, so it's just, it's very isolated We're, we all feel a lot of isolation. Um, we're all scared. I mean, you know, and what, God forbid our kid has a seizure and they don't hear it in the middle of the night or whatever you're thinking about. So, um, and we're all scared to give up the primary role of if, depending on what you're doing of caring for your child there, I mean, we, none of us can, um, and then we're all facing our own age and health issues. And so that's also, that's also hard. Um, I mean, when we're getting older and then we're starting to figure out who's going to live longer. And it's so hard to think about your child passing away before you. It's also really hard to think about us, um, uh, us not living as long as our child, because then we're like, oh my God, what's going to happen? So neither of those options are good. <laughs> Let me just make you say that. Um, and then we just worry about the impact if something does happen to us, this has on our other children or your other family members or your siblings or your aunt or, um, and um, we started with saying this, which is don't underestimate the impact this has, the emotional impact this has on your kids, on your, and your close family and whatever is your network. And like Barbara mentioned and Diane, they both have extended families, lots of people involved. I do too. And it's, it's just really hard. So um, and so just kind of to wrap up, just lots to consider. Um, hope this has been helpful. Um, you know, all three of us would be happy to uh, talk with any of you individually. Uh, we're all very passionate about it. We're all not even sure where we're going. So um, and um, but it's just the key is to start thinking about this early or like um, and early, like Dan Diane said, and just take it one step at a time. Learn with what you're comfortable with, you know, um, build build a program around your kids strengths. We focus so much on what our kids can't do. You know, look at what we all started with when we talked about our kid. Stacy can't read. Stacy can't write. Stacy, you know, doesn't, you know, but. You're, we all have kids who have wonderful traits, wonderful strengths, um, and focus on that because that's the life you want for, for him or her. Um, and then find a community to learn from and support you. So we have an amazing Dravet community, um, and that is so helpful. Use that community. I'd also just say, depending where you are, I feel very lucky that I have a very wonderful, broad community of other parents who have kids with special needs. Um, and that's been really, that has been really helpful for me. Um, and so it doesn't have to just be a Drabe family, you know, so yeah. use your community, use the parents in your school settings who have kids to, to help you. Um, because, um, I just, you, we feel so alone, so often, I should say, I feel so alone so often. Um, and so, and I'm seeing Barbara and Diane nod. And so, you know, um, use, get help to help you with this decision. So uh, with that, I think we'll turn it over to Q and A's unless Barbara or Diane, you feel like I missed something major. Are we ready to turn it over? I was just going to say one thing, trust your intuition and be kind to yourself and give yourself a lot of grace. Um, if you need a counselor, reach out to that. If you need some, because uh, I see a trauma therapist or we're doing it remotely, but yeah, so there's that. And, you know, maybe you need to see a psychiatrist. Maybe you need to get on some anxiety medications. Don't, you know, give yourself a lot of credit for what you're doing right. Don't focus on what you're doing wrong or, you're, you're, I mean, obviously our kids can be overwhelming, but try to find some positive stuff, especially about you because you're important too. That's great. Thank you. Wonderful way to end. <laughs> um, so I believe um, that uh, Dr. Veronica Hood is going to, if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat. We have actually not been seeing the chat questions. So if, we, if you were wondering about those, we're here now to answer those. Um, and so I will, um, I guess, turn it over to you, um, Veronica, to if there's any questions you'd like to ask either of us. Any of us, I should say, not either. Thank you guys so much. That was 
Really fantastic. I think maybe Aaron said in the chat, just talked about how amazing you three ladies are. And really, I'm I'm honored to be sitting amongst you getting to talk to you. That was fantastic. I think what a great resource to have you guys go through so many different aspects about this from personal experience. And so I think this is a really valuable um, webinar today and in the future for people to rewatch. Um, we don't have any, there's been lots of comments in the chat. We don't have any specific questions, but I think one of them, it wasn't a question, but I can turn it into a question. Um, so Sandy in the chat is saying that, you know, her daughter's very medically involved and their case manager from DMH just seems not to know much of anything about what resources are available. What would you advise in that scenario? Where should she go next? to find out more about resources or, you know, is there, is there another avenue that she should be looking down if her case manager isn't actually being very helpful? Ask for a new case manager. See if the <laughs> child um, qualifies for. The hard thing that I've noticed is like, for instance, there's a big, there's a huge caseload increase when they're, they turn 18 in, in our state. I mean, Kai went from having, a case manager with the SIBS program where she had a caseload of 17. And then when he got to adult services and we got out of the SIBS program and into residential, they had 70. And so if they can't, if they don't understand all the medical stuff and if they don't, if they can't devote enough time to your child, ask for another one and then just work the best you can. Ask, talk to your, talk to your kids' providers, talk to neurology, talk to pediatrician or primary care you know, reach out, just keep reaching out and keep pushing them for a case manager who can help you. You need it. You deserve it. Your child needs it. Your child deserves it. I think that's a Barbara, great. do you want to add anything just because you have a medical oh, yeah. as well? Right. I, I, a couple thoughts um, and adding on to what Diane just said, social worker. So find, I guess what I would say is um, three things. One, expand your community. So like I, I probably, along with DSF, I um, belong to, you know, parents of fragile kids, um, special ed community in my area. Um, I've also formed a coalition with other mothers who have continuous skilled nursing in the home. There are eight of us and we push back on the state constantly. We have a little group chat. We have our own Facebook page. And if we're having trouble with case manager, who's your case manager? What does your case manager do? Let's find a new case manager, which is always an option, but also don't be afraid to push back on the, the, the case manager department and say, you know, this is what I need and you're not meeting my needs. So I think advocacy is huge. I think um, finding a community of like-minded parents in this similar situation is huge because with numbers, becomes stronger. You can, you can have, be more effective as a group sometimes. And you can also lean on other parents who have been there. Um, and I think a social worker can come into play through a number of avenues. It could either be through your primary care practice. It could be through palliative care, which some of us might be in if we have more fragile kids. Um, it could be through the hospital. It could be through the school. So that's also their job. So use your clinical teams, use your social worker, use your community, and don't be afraid to push back. And that's sometimes what drives you to be a bigger advocate is just the experience of not getting your demands met and partnering with other parents to, to push back and get some stronger solutions for yourself and your child. You know, I was also going to say, if you can, if you have if you have time, and it really doesn't take that long, like for instance, in Washington State, the legislative session, and I think this year it's going to be a longer session. So they start in on January. There's a lot of ways you can reach out through your local ARC or your nationwide ARC or your statewide ARC. There's a lot you could do to push legislatures. And uh, all it takes is you can send emails, you can make a quick phone call, you can get involved with, I'm really active with Moms Rising as far as advocacy. It, it doesn't take much. It takes maybe five, maybe max 10 minutes a day, if that. But you have to keep, you know, it's like I was just thinking the Dr. Seuss, you know, Horton, here's the who. You know, your kids can't, you are literally your child's, you know, literally figuratively your child's voice. Speak up. 
you know, and case managers need to hear the words, I'm having a hard time. It's a hard week. Have you heard from any agencies that might be interested in serving Kai? Can I, are there any other resources? You, and if they tell you no, that's not definitely a no. You keep pushing because this is, your child can't do it by themselves. You are their voice. Yeah, don't take no for an answer unless, you know, it really, I mean, I've got even my daughter, Sierra, with the SCN1A. She will say things like to the insurance company, she hands, well, what do I need to do? Do you need a prior authorization? Do you need a letter of necessity? She's on it. So, yeah, you, this is not going to go away. We just need to keep pushing. And I, I would just add, I think that also harkens back to getting emotional support, whether it's through a therapist or through community, because oh, yes. you're already exhausted and having to do all that pushback is hard and mm-hmm. you can do it, but you might need someone else to help hold you up on those days when you feel like you're going to collapse. And so don't, don't forget to take care of yourself when you can. Um. I think there's no other questions. I'm definitely going to send you guys the chat transcript because there's just accolades to the three of you for all of this amazing content. I think a great way to end would just be to ask, um, and this is appropriate too, because Aaron just dropped in the chat, as a mom to a seven-year-old, this seems both far away and coming so soon. Thank you for all the great points to consider as he grows. If you could speak to someone like Aaron or someone whose child is approaching adolescence, What's the one thing where you would tell them, like, this is where you need to start? Um, I know there's probably 20 things you would want to tell them, but if, if you had to choose one, when you're at that kind of beginning of looking into all this, if each of you wouldn't mind to offer what, what you would say to someone like Erin as she begins this, what, what would you tell her to do to get started? I would I could, say- I could probably start that with that just because I I think about this a lot. So um I wish I, and I, I'm happy with all you, but um, I wish I focused on um, kind of daily living skills sooner for Stacy. I think when you're in the elementary, you know, grades one through five or six, you know, they're still trying to, they were still trying to get her to maybe think about reading or doing math kinds of things or whatever. And she's just not able to do that, you know, and it's really hard to, you know, um, acknowledge that when they're young. Um, but I, you know, I, I think there are so many things you can be thinking about in the, you know, when they're younger, if that's, you know, helping them learn to make their lunch or helping them learn to read, you know, some, you know, maybe learn basic things like what the woman's bathroom sign looks like or a stop sign or a walk, walking across the street. I mean, you know, I don't, I, I'm not, she can't walk across the street on her own, <laughs> you know, or looking for cars, you know, that are coming down the street or whatever. So I, I, I just think about, you know, try to be honest with what you think, where you think your child's going to be in 15 years. I think I, I thought about this a lot last night around, and you hear this, and I don't want this to come out depressing, but, you know, once that you realize it's Dravet, their growth rate is just so flat. You know, they just, their ability to get, gain new skills comes so slowly. Um, and so I don't think I would have ever predicted today um, where she is. I don't think I would have ever predicted when she's seven where she is today, I guess. Thanks, and, I don't know. Do, do Diane or Barb have have anything else they want to add? Um, well, you know what? I just, I, I think kind of uh, those of us that like try to keep journals and stuff, if I could go back to myself when Kai was seven or eight, one of the things to think about is, and, and back then we really didn't know how long he would live. I can, I can say I'm so much happier now that he's had his 24th birthday and I can go, wow. You know, at this point with the VNS, especially the chances of suit after relatively low. But if, if I could think about, because I was not able to do this and I had stuff going on with Sierra too, what is life going to be like when I can no longer pick him up and carry him to safety? And because when he was seven, he was little. 
and skinny and trying to get him to eat enough and all that. Well, things are different now. But just think about, you know, what resources might I have? And I want to say about five and a half years ago, when we started looking for a placement for him, the case manager said, well, you know, what would you tell somebody? Because they're just going to get like a cold, um, you know, assessment. And so I created a document called All About Kai. It needs to be, and it needs to be updated. But, you know, you're going to have maybe eight to 10 paragraphs. Like, you know, what does Kai like to do? Well, we know that he needs, he loves to go out. He loves to be out and about. He loves to say hello to people. Um, and I think part of what, um, what oh gosh, I just lost my train of thought here. Um, put all the good things in there. And then, for instance, with Kai, I know for a fact that he must keep his hands busy. If he's not keeping his hands busy, he's going to get into trouble and look for something to throw. So stickers, puzzles, Legos, and put all these things in. And like I said, I need to go back to it and update it. But, you know, focus on the things that are great about your kid and things that are challenging. I mean, it was really hard for us. Um, so the pediatrician, when Kai got to be about 16 or 17, said, you know, we can't do this. If you can't bring somebody with you, because security can't touch them. And, you know, Kai liked to go up and say hello to people. And some of these people were little or, you know, so yeah, think about a bunch of different things, reach out to other families. Um, don't listen to people that say, oh, well, he's not going to live very long or, oh, he's smearing poop. No one's going to want a, a poop smear. Well, he no longer does that. It was hard, but we got him past that. Try to focus on positive stuff, but yet be realistic and definitely self-care. If you're not sleeping, you need to talk to your doctor about what you can do about that. Um, if you need to exercise, find an exercise program that's realistic. Um, you know, um, if you need a therapist and this one doesn't seem to understand you, it's time for a new one. I mean, we've had really good case managers. I've been lucky at that, but you know, I've reached out I've, and whenever you can too, say thank you to people, say thank you to the nice teacher who gives you a positive comment about your kid, even though it's been a rough day, she's found something positive, you know, be nice, you know, hand out some Starbucks cards, you know, write a nice note, send a nice email, write a letter to the principal who, and just say, hey, you know, so all those things and, and just try not to be afraid. Easier said than done. I've had a real rough week with Kai, but I got together with Aaron for coffee this week. You know, Aaron, that was really nice. We did that. You know, so yeah, whenever you can. Val has been helping me out all week, take care of Kai, and he was smacking on her the past couple of days, which is embarrassing and awful, but now he's napping. He's on antibiotic. He's feeling better. So just try to ride those roller coasters because they will be there. If something doesn't work, speak up. Thanks, Diane. Barb, did, did you want to offer what you might say to? I'm going to answer that question with a little story. And I remember when Jake was probably five or seven years old, he was young, about that age. And um, he was new in school. We were in the process of, you know, trying to struggle through when he did attend school and his health wasn't good. And I remember talking to a man who was in charge of our flexible funding. He was probably DPH or from some agency. And I remember saying to him, Jake is so little right now and he's 50 pounds and he's so much work and so much care. And I said, I don't know what I'm going to do when he's bigger. Like I remember feeling that fear and having that conversation. And I almost laugh when I think back because I was like, what am I going to do if he's a hundred pounds? And now of course he's like 150 pounds, but it, you know, it's just, it was like baby steps. And he said to me, don't think that far ahead. If you project that far ahead, you're going to just worry yourself into the ground. So one day at a time, sometimes it's one step at a time, one week at a time, we all have really good days, weeks, months, years. Um, you know, it's just, it's going to be okay. You're going to figure it out. But I remember him saying to me, just manage what you can manage right now. And I still think about that advice because otherwise you can, like when you see the road coming down before you and, and I think it's different now because kids are diagnosed so much younger, like Jake wasn't even diagnosed until he was 10. So mm -hmm. I didn't have that image in my head of, oh, he has Dravet and oh, this might be his future and oh, it's going to progress like this. 
And I think that's kind of a double-edged sword for younger parents and younger children today. They're diagnosed earlier. They have much better treatments, sometimes much better outcomes because of that. But at the same time, they're also very well informed and it can be really frightening to look down that road. So, you know, and again, when he was diagnosed, um, he also has mitochondrial disease and they told us he wouldn't live to be 18 years old. So, you know, we went through the whole process of enrolling in palliative care, which I thought, oh, that means he's dying, which it didn't mean he was dying. It meant we had seven years of wonderful support for our family. He spent two years in hospice. Like Kathy said, if you had said to me back when I was having that phone conversation at five or seven, he's going to stop eating, he's going to stop walking independently, he's going to stop talking, he's going to spend two years in hospice, I would have just, I don't know, run. I don't know what I would have done. I would have fled. And so really one day at a time, exactly. somehow you're going to make it work. You're going to find your path. You're going to find your normal. And the only logistical, practical thing I would suggest that Diane touched on is very early on, I started a letter of intent for Jake. And I, I keep a binder in my kitchen in a drawer. Everybody knows where it is. And to be honest, we joke, it's called the if Barb gets hit by a bus binder because it's everything you need to know about Jake. And it has insurance information, our legal information, contacts for family, who are his doctors? How often does he see them? What are his meds? What does he like? How do we bathe him? How do we do his bedtime routine? It sort of lays it all out there and it needs constant updating. I can't even keep up with it half the time. Usually when I hire somebody new, I think, oh my God, I've got to go to the bus binder and like make sure it's up to date. It even has a training outline for my help. So I always say when I hire somebody, if anything happens, if you need to call 911, whatever, just take the binder and go because everything you need to know is in this binder. And so that brings me some comfort, but I still have the same fear that I had back when he was five and seven. And now I just have it projecting forward and I try not to think about it, but at the same time, you cannot avoid it. You have to, you have to be thinking about it. You have to be thinking about their future. You have to be thinking about your own future. And so what I try to focus on is what I can manage now, what I can control versus what I can't control, and really what makes Jake happy and what makes us reasonably happy. And, and all of that plays into what we've been talking about today. Where is he living? How are we managing his care? That all factors into all of your happiness and whatever you can manage in your life as a parent with a child like this. Great. I saw some comments that they love the tip about the bus binder. Um, <laughs> and I think that's fantastic. I think I had something similar, but wasn't as formal about it, but yeah, being able to have all that information in one place is fantastic. All right, ladies, I think we're wrapping the session up. Thank you all so much. Um, really appreciate it. Like I said, I'm just uh, in the presence of giants here and uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks Kathy and Barbara for doing this with me.